All right. Good morning, everyone. As always, it is a great honor and a privilege to be here with you all. So let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, God. You're worthy of all glory, honor, and praise, God. You're worthy of all worship. You're worthy of our discipline and our obedience, God. You're worthy of it all. And we know we fall so short of your glory each and every day. God, we do not love you as we ought. We do not pray as we ought. We do not read and study your word as we ought. God, and Jesus says the greatest commandment of all is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, all your strength, Father. And we, we do fall so short of that. So we do come in need this morning, God, in desperate need of your grace and your mercy, in desperate need of your spirit <clears throat> to help us, to guide us through this study, to illuminate your word to us. Father, we confess our sins before you, for our sins are many, and it is you whom we have sinned against, O oh God. Because we want to come to your word, we want to come before you with a right heart, a right mind, with a right attitude, God. Rightly, we want to come before you, God, so that we can benefit from your word this morning. So help us, God, we pray. Pray that you speak to and touch every heart this morning and guide us as we look at basically the plan of redemption, what Christ has done in laying down his life for his sheep, atoning for our sins, that is repairing the relationship that we need repaired with you, God, making right what is wrong, bringing sinful man rightly before holy God. So help us, God, and may it bring us to a place of worship, a place where we cast off self and take on and trust in all that Christ has done. Please help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're still in soteriology. We're now going into the topic of the atonement of Christ. So now we're going to look at the atoning work of Christ. First thing we're going to look at basically is the accomplishment of redemption. That is, the accomplishment is what Christ has done on behalf of sinners, of course, what he did was he laid down his life. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, if you want to start there with me, I'll give you somewhere to start at least, right? And Paul says in verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. So important, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. The fact that Christ died for our sins in itself is atonement. So practically, all religions have some com concept of atonement, a means by which reparations are made, sin is expiated, Deity is satisfied, and reconciliation is achieved between the deity and the sinner. Now, expiation is a, just a, a big word. Well, it's not that big. It's not as big as other words. But it, it, it's a deep word. It's a word of depth. It is the picture of the goat. Remember the scapegoat? They would take two goats. One goat would be the propitiation. That would be the sacrificial goat. He would be sacrificed, blood shed, and that goat would appease the wrath of God on behalf of God's people. The other goat, the priest would pray over and impute the sins of the people, if you will, in a kind of spiritual manner on this goat. By praying over this goat, they would send that goat out into the wilderness, expiation. So that's what that means. Expiation is the, the picture of the sins of the people placed on the goat and sent away. Well, that's what happened on the cross. Our sins were placed on Christ, whereas his righteousness is placed on us. So man-made religions propose some means by which the sinner must take an acceptable atonement to earn merit that will compensate for or erase sin. Removing guilt through good works, religious ritual, restitution, the payment of a penalty, the offering of a sacrifice, or some sort of self-abasement. 
The distinctive teaching of biblical Christianity is that God himself has made full atonement for sinners. And he accomplished this by the substitutionary sacrifice of his own son on the cross. Sinners contribute nothing by way of merit or sacrifice to the atonement. In fact, I believe it was Jonathan Edwards, I could be mistaken, not sure who claimed this. He states, the only thing you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary for the Savior to die. That's it. We need to understand this, that salvation is all of God, 100%, all wrapped up, if you will, and accomplished in the work of Christ, the finished, redeeming, atoning sacrifice of the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ. Robert Morey states this in his book, uh, Studies in the Atonement. I mean, right in the introduction, he comes out, he says, you know, it is popular in our day to state that the Bible is the inspired record of the unfolding drama of the history of redemption, right? Most people will tell you that. And for those of us who take the Bible seriously, this statement is true. The scriptures record the words and works of God in redemption. The scriptures also record the various responses of saints and sinners to the manifold redemptive work and revelation of God. But we must not be content with a mere assertion of the historical character of the word of God. We must be Berean. We must seek to understand the nature and purpose of the history of redemption. That is to go deeper than, if you will, just the... Uh, just what is said on the surface these days about this. Oh, yeah, Jesus died for me. And you know, what does that mean, though? So the doctrine of the atonement is the foundation of the gospel itself. God is perfectly righteous, and therefore, <clears throat> by definition, he cannot approve of a less than perfect righteousness in anyone who would have fellowship with him. Again, so important we understand the righteousness of God. He is perfectly righteous, holy, just. We need to understand this. Otherwise, what happens is we end up with a man-centered humanistic theology that basically, if you will, as we've dealt with now over time and time, states that God basically accomplished 99% of the work. The other 1% is really up to you. You must make a decision. You must, in and of yourself, in your fallen free will, choose. Now, it was interesting, I just wanna share this with you, I posted on Facebook, I thought it was cute. It was uh, Snoopy and he's holding up a sign, Happy Reformation Day, you know? So I was like, yes, amen, you know? Hallelujah, praise God. And, uh, you know, uh, one guy posts, free will day is every day. And I responded to him, I said, so man's fallenness and inability to do anything to please a holy and righteous God day? Hmm, you mean the free will that is free enslaved in sin? That one that is free to move around the prison cell? That one, question mark. Um, needless to say, he basically said, well, why, why even celebrate it all if your God makes you sin? And I told him, I said, you might want to wipe that crap off your face, basically. And it's just like, dude, seriously right now? I said, I, and I see this guy, he's always taking pictures of himself with people and saying, sharing the gospel, sharing the gospel, share. You know what I mean? It's like, bro, you don't need a million pictures of yourself sharing the gospel with people. If that's what you're doing, just do it, right? What are you doing? Look at me, look at what I'm doing. And look, there's nothing wrong with evangelizing, taking pictures, encouraging the saints, you know, to do the same. But it's constant with him. And I ended my response to him with this. I see you out evangelizing. I'm just curious as to what perversion of the gospel you're actually preaching. And I think I was accurate in my statement. Here's a man who is just out there trying to convince people to repeat a prayer. That's not the gospel, my friend, at all. Haven't heard nothing back, but I'm just saying, it is so important we get this right. 
We need to understand God. It brings us to a place of worship to how holy and perfect and righteous he is and how fallen we are. If not for God taking the first step, I promise you, I'd probably be dead and burning in hell right now because that's the life I lived before salvation. God, in his ultimate wisdom, grace, and mercy, did what only he can do. And he didn't come knocking on the door of my heart. He snatched me up and dragged me to his son, ripping out my heart of stone by his spirit and giving me a heart of flesh so that I could respond to the gospel, the good news of what he has actually done. That's the gospel. And if you're preaching anything else, I'm sorry. It's not the gospel. It's a man-centered ideology that is built on other man-centered ideologies that has taken place and taken root over the last 2,000 plus years. I'm just saying, if we do not know our history, guess what? As one man says, we're definitely doomed to repeat it. And today, there's a lot of evangelic fish out there who are spineless and will not tell people that you are a wretched, miserable, pitiful, pathetic sinner headed straight to hell and you need Christ. You need a savior. Good news, God did what only he could do on your behalf. He sent his son to atone for your sins. Now, the doctrine of the atonement is the foundation of the gospel itself. God is perfectly righteous and therefore, by definition, he cannot approve of a less than perfect righteousness in anyone who would have fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 5 says this, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. What does that mean, John? What are you telling us? Well, light and darkness are very familiar symbols used throughout scripture. Intellectually, light refers to biblical truth while darkness refers to error or falsehood. Morally, light refers to holiness or purity, while darkness refers to sin or wrongdoing. Simply put, God is holy, just, perfect, and righteous, whereas we're the exact opposite. Unholy, unjust, imperfect, and unrighteous. God is light, the whole world is dark. Unless we are brought into the light by the grace and mercy of God. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount states this, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. All right, let me ask you, Christians, how many of you meet that standard even as Christians? You know what the only perfection about you is when God looks at you and sees the righteousness of his son imputed to you. That is a perfect righteousness. And what do we do with all that God has done for us and a perfect righteousness? We sin. We're foul. We're wretched. We're miserable. We justify it. It's only by the grace and mercy of God that we are saved at all, right? That's just the reality. That's why Paul is able to say in Romans 7, Oh, wretched man, I am. I mean, here's the things that, man, these are the desires God has put on my heart. These are the things that I desire so strongly to do, yet I don't. These are the things that I desire so strongly to avoid at all cost, and so strongly not to do, yet I do. I find this war, this waging war in my members, the war between the flesh and the spirit, between the righteousness that is now mine in Christ and the desires I have and my sin nature. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Praise be to God through Christ. One day we will, brethren, be delivered entirely from the presence of sin. And that's the good news. Why? Because God gave his son to atone for our sins. The perfect Christ. So, Matthew 5, 48, Jesus says, you're to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In setting an unattainable standard, Christ sums up the demands of the law. James 2, 10 states that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. This standard is impossible to meet by any human merit as all are 
conceived and born in sin, hence disqualifying us from the time of conception. Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Even at conception, absolute perfect righteousness is the standard that God himself has set, and he could not lower the standard without compromising his own perfection. He who is perfect could not set an imperfect standard of righteousness. I mean, seriously, that would be that would not even be logical because then it would not be a righteous standard, but an unrighteous standard. You with me? God cannot compromise who he is. He's God. There's no compromising God. We understand that, right? This, though, is the marvelous truth of the gospel, that Christ has met that standard on our behalf. And in his atoning work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, he alone secured salvation for sinful mankind. Sinners, by definition, have already violated God's law and rebelled against him. And because sin has infected the very core of their being, they have no way to pay for sin or secure the righteousness needed to stand before God. Sinful mankind has no inclination or ability to submit to God's authority. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8 real quick. <clears throat> and when we talk about total depravity and total inability, it's total in the sense that we're totally unable to please God. It's also total in the sense that it is thorough. That means it is throughout the whole person, from the bottom of our wicked hearts, through our flesh, our bodies, our actions, our minds, our thoughts. All that we are is thoroughly corrupt. That's what we mean when we say total depravity, totally depraved in every which way. One, unable to please God ever. And two, we are thoroughly corrupt throughout. It's so important we understand this. Romans 8, verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is what? Not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are corrupt in their sin, those who are unconverted, cannot please God whatsoever. See, because sinners are not even able to submit themselves to the authority of God, they are doomed to face the punishment of the outpouring of God's righteous wrath. Even the wrath of God is righteous. John 3, 36, Jesus speaking, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, side note, I just want to point this out to you. Because we all know John 3.16, right? We all know John and we question, we wonder, but didn't God just love the whole world that he just sent his son to die for and save every person? What we need to understand is context. Note this, the climax of John chapter 3 is not that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, John 3.16, but the climax of this chapter is here, seen in one of two alternatives. One, genuine faith, which is characterized by obedience to Christ. Two, defiant disobedience, demonstrating the unbeliever's true nature as unconverted. Then bringing to the forefront of this chapter the looming judgment that is hanging over unbelievers. And that judgment is the wrath of God, which, as Romans 1.18 tells us, is being revealed from heaven and will abide forever on the reprobate in eternal hell. It's so important 
We take God at all his word and st stop ripping things out of context to settle an unsettled uncomfort within ourselves because some things in scripture are hard to understand and hard to take. We need to be constant in submitting ourselves under the truth of God's word and surrendering ourselves to that truth. All right, 2 Thessalonians 1.9 speaks of those who were persecuting the church at Thessalonica and those who did so, as it is says, will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. The divide between the sinner's depravity and God's unapproachable holiness is so vast that the sinner, even with his noblest efforts, has no hope of ever standing in a right relationship with the holy God. The only hope for salvation comes, as it must, from outside the sinner. It is found in God's own provision of full and free atonement for sin. That glorious provision satisfies justice and releases the grace of forgiveness. As we talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul tells us that the very heart of the gospel is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Man's depravity has established the need for salvation. And again, that goes right along with what Edwards quoted. The only thing you brought to the table is the need for the Savior to die. You brought sin. That's what we brought. That's it. The Father's unconditional election has formed the plan of salvation, but it is the atonement of God, the Son, that accomplishes that redemption in space and time. So in other words, we know that in eternity past, Ephesians 1, 4, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, right? In eternity past, we've already dealt with that in depth. In time and space, it is the atonement, the atoning work the substitutionary sacrifice of God the Son that accomplishes redemption for the sinner. If we're going to be fundamentally committed to the gospel, we must devote ourselves to an accurate, robust, biblical understanding of the atonement. Now, we're going to look at as much as we can of this, the plan of salvation and the mission of the Son. Previously, we examined the biblical teaching concerning the Father's plan of redemption, his intention to rescue his creatures from sin and death, and to restore them to a right relationship with himself. That gracious plan materialized in God's decree of unconditional election. You remember we dealt with that. That is, that God's choosing of some is not conditioned on anything in them or anything they did. It's unconditional in the sense that it is God who has chosen all for his good pleasure for his glory. That's why he does what he does. His free and sovereign decision to set his love on certain individuals and on the basis of nothing in, free and so uh, in themselves, sorry, but solely because of the good pleasure of his will to choose them to receive his salvation. Yet in his wisdom, God did not decree that his salvation would be accomplished and applied to the sinner merely by the sovereign choice. You guys with me? In other words, God chose to save us, but he also chose in which way he would do so. Instead, the triune God devised an eternal plan in which man's salvation would be accomplished by the redemptive work of God the Son, and in which the saving benefits secured by the redemptive work would be applied by God the Spirit. You guys remember Ephesians 1 4? We're chosen by the Father, purchased by the Son, sealed by the Spirit. Blessed Godhead three and one. Blessed Godhead three and one. Jesus Christ, God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, would take on all the weakness and infirmity, yet not sin of human nature and would secure for his people the righteousness, forgiveness, and cleansing that they could never obtain for themselves. 
He would live as a man in perfect obedience to the Father, die on the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice to atone for the sins of those whom the Father had chosen, and rise again in victory over sin and death, all in the power of the Holy Spirit. Redemption would be accomplished by the miraculous incarnation, vicarious life, penal substitutionary death, and death-defeating resurrection of the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how important this is to understand this? Once you take any part from this and put man there, you've now taken God off the throne and put man on the throne. Once man is at any point meriting his own salvation in and of himself and by himself, you've done removed all that Christ has done. If you take one small piece, you may as well get rid of it all. You may as well get rid of it all. It is imperative for the student of scripture to understand that the son's mission to accomplish redemption is birthed out of this Trinitarian plan of salvation. The atonement wrought by the son is inextricably noted in the Father's purpose to save those whom he has chosen. Thus, in undertaking to pay for sin and provide righteousness, Christ was not going rogue, haphazardly, embarking on a mission of his own devising. In fact, it's completely the other way around. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. From the time of his conception to the time of his ascension, all that Christ did and said and all that he was was in absolute perfect accordance and obedience to the Father's will. You with me? Jesus stated explicitly that he came to do not his own will, but the will of the one who sent him, John 6, 38. That is, he was acting strictly in accordance with a specific agreed-upon plan devised in the eternal counsels of the Trinity. See, we don't always see it like that. When it says, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world, we don't look at it as what it is. This is before the foundation of the world, a triune council of Father, Son, and Spirit, knowing the end from the beginning, and yet devising this plan. It is this plan that was devised in eternity past, which Jesus Christ in his humanity, in his flesh, says, I did not come to do my will, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is that will to redeem lost mankind. <clears throat> a side note here. Many theologians refer to this in different ways. Some simply call this God's eternal plan, purpose, or decree of salvation. After a popular Latin phrase, pactum salutis, which means agreement of salvation. A pact. Others, however, speak of it as a covenant. Whether the covenant of redemption or the covenant of creation. For two reasons, we contend that it is inaccurate to describe this pretemporal intra Trinitarian agreement as a covenant. That's just a uh, big, large way of saying that this happened bef in eternity past, before time, there was this council, right? So, this intra Trinitarian agreement. And we, again, uh, do not refer to it as a covenant. Here's why. First, in scripture, the word covenant is used to designate an agreement between two unequal parties, a sovereign Lord and what they call a vassal a, or lesser person. Though there is a diversity of roles within the Godhead, the person of the Trinity, persons of the Trinity are nevertheless entirely equal. So you need to understand that as well, that they are entirely equal, co-eternal, equal in everything. There's no one that is greater than the other, if they're all three, equal as God with different roles. There is no Lord-vassal relationship that characterizes a covenantal agreement. 
Second, scripture seems to indicate that a covenant is instituted by blood, Hebrews 9, 16 through 18, which certainly does not describe the pactum salutis. Therefore, this intra-Trinitarian agreement is distinctly different from a biblical covenant. It is more accurate to see it as an aspect of God's eternal decree. And we went through all the decrees of God, what God had decreed to do in eternity past. So several passages of scripture testify to this pretemporal that is occurring or happening before the existence of time, determinate plan of salvation. In the first place, some passages identify the son's atoning work as divinely predetermined. Paul speaks of it as the father's eternal purpose, which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Ephesians chapter three, verse 11. This verse clearly states that the work that Christ accomplished during his earthly mission was carried out according to a predetermined plan, according to the Father's purpose that was devised in eternity. Turn with me to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians, uh, we're going to look at three passages. Ephesians uh, 1, verse 9. Verse 11 and 311. Chapter 1, verse 9 says this. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. We see a purpose. We see a plan. We see something that is predetermined. Verse 11. Also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his Purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. This is according to the eternal decree of God and his purpose. This is something that was purposed to take place. Chapter 3, verse 11. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose, which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we just simply see the eternal decree of God manifest in the person of Christ. This was brought about in Christ here in time and space, demonstrating to us God's eternal intra-Trinitarian decree, which he decreed to redeem lost mankind through the person and works of his son, God the Son, Jesus Christ. Similarly, when Jesus predicted his betrayal at the Last Supper, he says this, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. Literally, the Greek is according to the determination. He goes because this is what was predetermined. This was God's method, God's way of redeeming lost mankind. And Jesus, submitting himself completely to the eternal decree of God, according to the perfect will of God, he goes to give himself a sacrifice for our sins. Acts 2.23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. The hands of godless men were not the ultimate cause of the death of Christ. We need to understand this was again according to God's eternal decree. They were the effecting cause. They were the guilty cause of the death of Christ. Acts 17, 31, because he, God, has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through man, who he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Again, we see Christ being the one appointed to die on behalf of sinners and for their sins. So not only do we see as has been determined, but also that Christ was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You remember that word? Foreknowledge, prognosco, prognosis. Um, remember the foreknowledge is prognosco or prognosis, which literally means previous determination, purpose, and has to do with more than God just looking down the tunnel of time to see and learn. You remember the Arminian position of salvation? Oh, sure, yeah, God, God chose, but he chose after he looked 
down the tunnels of time and saw those who would make a decision for him. And based on their decision for him, then God chose them for salvation, right? Again, that is so fallen and so just full of error. Um, it's not even funny. <clears throat> Prognosco or foreknowledge is God has marked out beforehand. It is literally as he looks down, he is the one who marked out these things, right? Looking at mankind through the sinful lump of clay, Romans, remember, Romans 9, choosing to show mercy on some while passing over others, remember, according to his eternal decree. God chooses, he marks out beforehand those. What's the same thing with Christ? He was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Do you, I, it's so hard to fathom the fact that every moment of Christ's life was in perfect alignment with a plan that was predetermined many thousands of years earlier in eternity past, every single second. And then how about this? What about you? How about your life? God is sovereign over all things. He's predetermined each of us. You know, the day of your salvation was predetermined in eternity past, and God chose to save you. So God didn't simply look down the tunnel of time to learn. First off, God knows all things. He doesn't learn, by the way. He literally marked it out as his plan from eternity past. That is the only reason anyone is ever saved, and that is exactly what Christ was fulfilling when he came and gave himself as a sacrifice, as a substitute, as an atoning sacrifice to atone for the sins of his people, not the whole world. We're going to get into that more. The Son of Man goes as it has been determined, that is, according to the determination, though he would be betrayed by Judas, the death of the Messiah <clears throat> had been determined in eternity past. <clears throat> 1 Peter 1.20 says this, For this reason Jesus is said to be foreknown before the foundation of the world. Again, 1 Peter 1.20 <clears throat> and the one in whom grace is granted from all eternity according to the purpose, prothesis, Greek word, of God, 2 Timothy 1.9. God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, 2 Timothy 1.9. Again, all this was according to God's predetermined plan or purpose in eternity past. <clears throat> Indeed, the crucifixion itself is merely the execution of the eternal purpose of God. For Peter states that Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, Acts 2.23. And the entire church confesses to God that Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and Israel did only whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. We see that in Acts 4, 27 and 28. Even these wicked men, if you will, who Christ died at their hands, did only what God had pre-planned in eternity past. They weren't working roguelike. They were only working simply according to God's predetermined plan. We're going to end with this. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 1. I want to take you back to that passage real quick. <clears throat> and I want to read for you, just to grab the context here, verses 5 through 11. 2 Timothy 1, 5. Paul, again, he's writing to, to Timothy in Ephesus. You guys know the context. It says, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I'm sure that it is in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, 
which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Now, Concerning verse 9, I want to share this with you. Wiest, Kenneth Wiest states this concerning verse 9. It says, This act of God saving and calling us was not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. The words according to are the translation of kata, which in its local use means down. The word down has the idea of domination or control. Thus, salvation is not dominated or controlled by the works of the sinner. The works of a sinner do not enter into the economy of God, whereby he gives salvation to the individual. All of which means that salvation is not earned nor merited by anything that the sinner does. It is dominated by God's purpose in salvation, that of glorifying himself in the bestowal of salvation and in the life of the person who is the recipient of that salvation. Salvation, therefore, can never be earned. If it could, the sinner would be glorified. Salvation must be a free gift with no strings tied to it, and that is grace. The act of God giving salvation as a free gift to one who does not only not deserve it, but who deserves punishment for his sins. This grace is given us in Christ Jesus in the sense that he made the gift of salvation possible through his death on the cross by which he satisfied the just requirements of the law which sinners broke, thus making it possible for a righteous God to show mercy to a hell-deserving sinner on the basis of justice satisfied. Jesus Christ satisfied the justice of God on our behalf. This grace was given us before the world began. The expression in the Greek is pro chronon ainyan, literally before eternal times. Expositors commenting on these words says expresses uh, sorry, expositors commenting on these words says this, expresses the notion of that which is anterior to the most remote period in the past conceivable by any imagination that man knows of. In other words, talk about eternity past. It was before the time of the ages, before time was reckoned by aeons or cycles, and that was before the creation of the universe. That grace was given the believer, not actually, for he did not exist, but in God's decree. See what I mean? And when you receive the grace of God in salvation, you are simply confirming a decree of God which took place, again, what, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 years ago before time began. Is that awesome? Talk about God keeping his promises. Vincent says this, the gift planned and ordered in the eternal councils is here treated as an actual bestowment. Therefore, 1 Timothy 1, 9 would be translated as such. The one who saved us and called us in the sphere of a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own private purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Which brings it all down, sums it all up. We see God's purpose, his predetermined plan, his foreknowledge all coming together for the sake of redeeming a lost mankind, all being wrought through the person and works of Jesus Christ, the Lord. This is what is so awesome about salvation. This is what is so awesome about sharing the gospel with the lost. Because if you do, by God's grace, get to see one come forward, you're seeing an eternal 
decree be manifest in present time. You're seeing something that was planned before any time and thing existed now come to pass in time and space. I don't know about you, but that's miraculous. That's awesome. There's just words that don't describe how awesome that is. And all because Christ in time and space fulfilled, appeased, um, satisfied God's justice, God's wrath, removed the sin from the sinner placed on him, his righteousness, because he came all according to the will of the Father to fulfill and do what God had planned in eternity past on behalf of those whom he has chosen to save in eternity past. And we get that and are the beneficiaries of that here in time and space presently. I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for such a great salvation, O oh God, that you have given us in Christ Jesus our Lord, that you have brought about according to your eternal decrees and eternity past. And Lord, as we continue to study these deep truths, may they have such an effect on our hearts and our minds, God, that the only response is a doxology of praise unto you to just shout out from within uh, just praises of adoration. God, that you're so awesome and so gracious and merciful to save wretched sinners like us, deserving of an eternity in hell. Thank you for such a great salvation in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you for the atonement. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray for the worship this morning, God. We pray for the songs that will be sung. God, that everything will be done for your glory. We pray for our pastor as he gets ready to preach your word, to proclaim forth your truths to us, God. We just pray, God, that all that is done today would be for your glory. Father, we want to be in confession today as we are getting ready to go to the communion table. We are getting ready to come to the Lord's table. We want to do so rightly with confession, uh, Lord. We just want to stand right before you. So help us, please, God, to examine ourselves between now and the time of... Uh, the communion table, it got to truly just surrender all that we are to you, to lay it all down at the cross where atonement was made for sins. So please help us. We praise you and thank you. All these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Any questions? Kaylee, did you have a question? No. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs>